let's start. Jonathan, why are Jewish guests so important for Swiss tourism? And where are they so important in Swiss tourism? I sort of, there are some, some specific locations, right, where um, at certain points in, in time during the year, sort of, there is a, an important quantity of Jewish guests. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear and see me. Um, I can't see you. And can you read a little bit what's going on? So if there is anything, I will, uh, yeah, I hope we can talk here. Uh, please, first of all, by the way, feel free to, uh, it's, it's your encounter, not my encounter. So really feel free to ask all your questions, all the questions you have. Um, there are no wrong questions, even questions you might think this is a weird question. Feel free to share it here. So it's really your encounter. I'm going to do my best to answer as much as possible and really engage into a dialogue. We speak first of all about the Jewish guests generally in Switzerland. Um, there is no the typical Jewish guests, as the Jewish guests are so diverse like any other guests in general. Um, but I think most of the questions that we will also discuss today mainly refer to the, let's say, Jewish Orthodox guest. I don't like this word Orthodox Jews. Anyway, this, it's not a typical Jewish word to say Orthodox, it's rather a Christian word to say an Orthodox. Let's leave it like this, let's say the religious Jews um, were very famous of coming here to uh, certain areas in Switzerland. And uh, maybe a, a general reason why these people come so um, typically in bigger groups is, as we will see during these encounters, it's mainly because people who have specifically religious needs typically want to be, in part of, be part of a bigger group, as many of these needs, of these religious needs, can only be Built within the groups. That's a typical uh, thing that's happened that the religious Jewish guests travel within big groups and also they come to Switzerland mainly in summer after the uh, after one of the Jewish holidays of Tisha B'Av. It's, it's a sad holiday and after this day they start traveling. Now indeed during the last years about three to five destinations have been very well visited. One of them is here in Davos, we have Arosa, the Sass Valley, um, uh, um, South Moritz, so Engadin would be one. Hope I haven't missed any. So these were many the, the big, the big four. Um, and again, we'll see because the infrastructure is here, the infrastructure is well for their needs. So that, uh, that's probably the main reason why they do. But the importance of the Jewish guests is probably something that other people can answer better. We're going to have time in the afternoon. Probably this is a broader question, question to them is how much important they are. Definitely in terms of like economic uh, numbers and economic... Uh, so facts and figures, I think we'll leave it for the, for the experts in the afternoon. So I'll be very happy now for the first, let's say, I think 40, 45 minutes to answer a lot of general questions about Judaism after my colleague Michel will take over. And so I think this is about the idea of the morning to talk more bit general, that you can ask all the general questions and then in the afternoon, second part, or Early afternoon will be more specific about the specific cases that have happened last year or during the last years and discuss together with you what would be the best practice to handle this kind of intra intercultural intra -intra communication. Yes, exactly. And really, sort of this encounter, uh, the quality, say, of the encounter um, largely depends also on you. I think um, I wrote that already on Moodle, the, the questions you prepared. Uh, most of them are really good. I think uh, it, uh, sort of they, they show that you um, are well prepared, at least um, those that will present on today's encounter. So I think that was a, a really good um, start. Um, but sort of, uh, and, and obviously, Jonathan and, and Michel, they have received these questions. They can sort of answer to them, um, but um, better than sort of answering to a sheet. Uh, it's, it's more fun, it's more interactive if they answer to concrete questions by you. So please sort of engage and be, be active. Um, but um, I think sort of maybe we could start sort of with, uh, with one or two questions sort of that, uh, that you uh, read in, um, sort of that, that you read by the, the students, which sort of maybe hold your attention sort of um, maybe you could, maybe either you want to start sort of with general general um, remarks or general uh, questions that, that, that arise in most of these encounters that you do, 
um, or sort of you can start with a more specific question as you wish. And like this, sort of the students have in the meantime, and I come a bit closer to be able to read the chat. Uh, like this, the students in the meantime, they have the opportunity to ask questions. Okay. Great. So, as I said, feel free to interrupt, to write. Uh, so, Alex will help me here to, uh, to read. He's closer. He's still yes. too far. Thank exactly. You. I'll do the interaction with okay, the. Okay, great. So, you're interacting between chat. the group and, and me as I'm speaking here with the camera. So, actually, one of the questions that people, uh, that, I, that I read here several times and people keep on asking is uh, well, how is the typical Jewish guest and how much is he or she influenced by his or her local culture? We have a Jewish guest from the US, or from Israel, from, from the Benelux states. And one thing I definitely want to say, maybe already at the beginning, first of all, there is no the typical Jewish guests. Um, Jews are that diverse than like, any other religion or any other culture or any other nation or state, however you want to call it. We even make the joke saying two Jews, three opinions, which really shows this diversity. You also see it in terms of uh, religion. So there are some Jewish people who say, oh, we have to take the Torah, the, the Bible, literally, and really keep every, every law that, that has been written. Some people are more traditional, would say, I keep that law, but with this law, I'm a bit more flexible. Some other will say, I don't care about the law at all, but I care about the, the tradition or about other things. So two Jews, three opinions. That's a bit the attitude. So generally, it's very, very, very diverse. And most of the tourists that you see, um, most of the Jewish tourists that you see, probably people will not even know that these people are Jewish. So that's, that's one thing, they're very, very diverse. Um, now are Jews influenced by the country they're from? I would say definitely yes. This is something you see a lot. So you, of course, much influenced by your religion, but of course, as well, where you've grown up. Uh, I've seen it myself when I traveled a lot and went to different Jewish communities. I feel a bit that everything that happens around the, let's say, uh, the community of the majority of the people typically influences also the minority of the Jewish people. Give an example, the Jews in Italy, where I went to the synagogue, I felt like I could be in a Catholic church. In terms of culture, in terms of people are extremely, extremely tradition, but as soon as they're out, they, they live in another world. And this is also something I saw a lot with, with my Catholic friends in Italy. They really see a lot of points in common. In, in Switzerland, for example, I have a bit the attitude, so this is not scientifically correct, but at least I feel a bit, people in Switzerland are quite religious, but they don't like so much institutions. So very much, uh, we don't really need too many institutions. People often say, I believe in God, but I don't need all these never churches, uh, mosques or synagogues. I have my own connection to God. This is something I see a lot also with my Jewish friends here in Switzerland. So definitely, yes, we're very much influenced by the other cultures around us. It's also part of our culture. So uh, this makes the Jews very, very much diverse. It is as a, as a little opener for, uh, for the questions and for the discussion. And, and in that sense, sort of one, one uh, question by several students was also sort of whether you would precisely sort of whether the distinction between orthodox, which a uh, term you do not like, what would you what would you call them then? Sort of more traditional or more more um, conventional or is there sort of does this distinction make sense at all? Sort of no orthodox versus not orthodox or is it sort of is it uh, devoid of of content of sense? I think it's too much constructed this word because um, what does orthodox mean? It's actually it comes from the, from the Christian Church actually the Orthodox Church which is the one who does the, the right way. Now, who does it the right way? Who understands Judaism the right way? I personally have a very much, I don't like this word, I don't like, don't think that any group can monopolize a religion saying we are doing it the right way. So that's why, let's say, let's say more traditional, more religious people, but we can also use, of course, for the discussion in terms of orthodox here, just that I personally believe it, it's a wrong word to use, but um, no worries in using it in the discussion. We're also using it in writing text, in the booklets, so it's definitely a, a common word. It was just a personal, on a personal note, I think it's, it's wrong use of the term. That's, that's my personal mm -hmm. yes. Um Maybe, so when, when people think of Orthodox Jews, 
They especially think also of Jews whom you recognize um, because of their clothing. You know? Sort of does that. Uh, so, like, how how to describe Jews that use sort of uh, the black long uh, coats, the hat, sort of that have the curly hair. Yeah. What, no, we what, say we say orthodox. So yeah, it's definitely okay. again, it's a completely used it's uh -huh. a term that we also use. Yeah, we okay. say orthodox. Okay, right. So um, from your side, sort of, do you have what question regarding Orthodox or other Jews do you have in concrete? Sort of, um, maybe you can also just refer to the questions that you sent in already um, in a written in a written um, sort of uh, by email. Um, Sandro asks, no, do more traditional Jewish guests need a special treatment in general? Sort of, how much is sort of traditional um, thinking and practicing of religion bound to a special treatment than here uh, in Davos or other places? Mm, it's a very good question. Yes, definitely. So people who are uh, Orthodox Jews they just still use this word to make it easier for the conversation. Um, so definitely uh, most of these guests, they have special needs. Uh, we'll see, I mean, for just for Shabbat, for praying. So there are indeed special, special needs. That's by the way also the group, why, the reason why people like to travel in big groups as it's typically easier to organize things in bigger group, like kosher food or a room to pray. That's first of all, yes, there are some special needs. Now the question is, of course, who is responsible is it to have these needs done? Is it the guest that can just ask for more special needs? Or is it the, the hotel or the location, like here in Davos? This is indeed something that has been discussed a lot last year and two years ago. Um, most of the, let's say like this, most of the guests that come here and most of the people who provide here uh, housing or places, they definitely adapt to each other. It's a typical market situation. You know you're going to have guests with specific needs, so you completely adapt to them and on the other. And, uh, and if you come as a guest, you of course never expect everything to be like at home, but you always appreciate what people try to provide as much as they can for, for your needs. I think it's a very typical, uh, like a marketplace, there is a demand and there is a supply, uh, as you see it also with, with many other guests. But yes, there are special needs, but most of them can be required here in the uh, in world, for example. Um, there's more questions coming in. Pascal Lutti asks, now in general, do you have any knowledge about the treatment of Jewish tourists by Swiss inhabitants, sort of in relation to their appearance, the clothes, the kippah, etc., etc.? Sort of, um, some research apparently showed that, especially in the mountains, special situations can occur because of the topic, sort of basically because of the, the appearance. So sort of, um, I guess, sort of, if you if you write Pascal special situations, basically, uh, not sort of not very positive reactions. I imagine. Is that your questions? Is that is that your question, Pascal? Yes, exactly. Mostly. Sort of, yeah, the, the special look, sort of, what does this provoke with um, local people? And, and, and I guess maybe there, sort of, you don't even have to um, sort of only focus on, on tourism destinations, sort of in general, in Switzerland, sort of, do Jews experience negative uh, reactions by, by other people if they're dressed um, traditionally in an orthodox way? And sort of, is this maybe more more marked, even more visible in, um, in tourism, in, in alpine areas, um, or is that generally a problem or generally no problem? Thank you, Pascal, for the question. I, yes, indeed. I mean, uh, first of all, we have to see as soon as people come who are dressed differently in any place in the world, of course, the first reaction is like, okay, what's going on? It's something that, that attracts typically people's attention. Now, of course, if you have a typical um, religious Jew walking in a, in a big city as one person, uh, of course, it's less, 
it less causes, let's say, uh, attraction than when you have a group. In summer, we have here up to 5,000 Swiss people. Uh, most of them, again, dressed in a, in a very religious and orthodox uh, way that make, I don't know how much percentage of the population at this time in the, in the host. So it's not one person, it's a very, very big group. And yes, of course, there are people. There are people who are, who are very, very generally happy and say they welcome them as guests, like any other guests, and happy that these people are coming. But there are also some people who feel like threatened. They feel like, oh, this is not anymore my home. This is not anymore my place. Here come this group that is unknown to me. They don't look the way, don't dress the way, don't speak the way I'm used to, to speak with. And it's threatening me. There are a lot. They, they do things different. They eat differently. So there are people who see it indeed as a, as a danger, as something uh, not feeling home here uh, anymore. And from the point of view of the Jewish people, this, um, again here, I'm rather, I'm here generally very much an optimist. So generally, I think you have to see positive. Most people that walk around dressed up Jewish in Switzerland, let's say in the cities, but also here, most of the people's reaction is, we don't care, in terms of, I don't care you're as, uh, the way you're dressed, as much as I don't care where you're from and, and, and what's your language, what's your name, as long as you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. This is the way, way majority of the people, which is also very nice and fine. And there is a minority that is specifically interested and would def def definitely start asking a lot of questions, like, are oh, you wear this uh, black hat, what's the background? So people are generally very much interested. And of course, you also have, unfortunately, also those people who are very generally uninterested and negative. So I see it myself. If I wear a kippah um, on the street, yes, most of the people won't really pay attention. One or two would be even positive. And unfortunately, also some would be very negative. They do not like it. So this is a reality, unfortunately. But again, you have to see the perspective. As I said, overwhelming majority is positive. Um, Neutral positive attitude. When do you wear it? Personally, I only wear when I go to uh, to the synagogue and walking back. So sometimes I just keep it when I when I went out when I go out from the synagogue and walk to home. And I suddenly realize that it's a bit different. People look at me differently. Um, How does that feel? Different. Sort of if you when when you realize okay yeah sort of there is just something that calls people's attention. Are you sort of very used to it? Does that leave you cold in that sense? Or? Mm, personally, I personally do not like it. I don't want to cause any uh, people's attention for, for about any reason. So I haven't done anything which is different. I haven't said anything. I just were a, a, a religious symbol, which I believe shouldn't provoke anybody. That would be my attitude, as I'm not hurting anybody. So I personally don't like the fact that indeed some people would, would, would get a... Uh, Attention and all. Typically, you start already looking around uh, and hope that, of course, these people are all positive. And uh, if it happened that somebody would say something bad, this is uh, a reality. You live in Zurich? Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, yes. And in Zurich, that's the biggest uh, Jewish community in Switzerland. Right? There is a big Jewish community in Switzerland. It's a very, again, very diverse community. Uh, there is a, a religious Orthodox community. In, in Zurich, there is a lot of also a lot of non-religious, a lot of traditional Jews. Again, it's a very diverse community. The Swiss Jew, uh, the old Zurich community. Yes. Okay, thank you, Nata. Let's see what other questions have come in. Um, Mirko asks, now how is the reaction of the special needs can sometimes not be matched by a hotel? Um, should we... Yeah, well, let's, let's just take one question after the other now. Sort of, um, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense to, um, instead of like, cluster them, or, mm -hmm. or, or should I... No, no, let's go one by one. Uh, so, so one is, or, or let, let, me, let me add one or two more. Sort of one is... The, the, the hotel, sort of what happens if they cannot really meet um, speci specific requirements. Um, and then uh, Roger asks now, um, sort of, 
referring to the diversity you just described now, um, can this con concept also be applied to um, can this concept also be applied for more religious Jews? Sort of how can they be described as a rather homogeneous group? So yeah, if if you okay, let's stick to these two questions because I think uh, they are both sort of rather big questions. Like um, in general, no, sort of how how would you describe then like Jews that that come to Switzerland? Sort of you describe them obviously sort of what they have in common is their faith. Um, and then sort of would you distinguish them by their nationality or sort of how to to sort of what are like um, traits of, of maybe subgroups, I guess sort of um, that would be a question, the question by, by Roger. And the other question is sort of what to do, what to do if a hotel cannot meet the requirements. In that sense, maybe also how flexible um, are they sort of what are really needs that have to be met? Otherwise, sort of they simply would not stay in a hotel. And what are requirements maybe that are sort of nice to have but not must have? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe let's start a bit with, uh, with Mirko's questions about uh, question about the requirements. I would say most of the Jewish people, and um, once again, it's always about the religious Jewish people, I just keep on repeating it because non religious, I say less tra or traditional people. They have, do not have any specific needs. They just go to the hotel and they check in, check out. So there, are no, there are no any specific needs. With the Orthodox Jewish community, um, most of them will probably not go in a hotel. They will uh, rent an apartment. This is something we see also here in Davos. I don't know the exact number. But they will go to a kosher hotel, which is a kind of a hotel that runs after Jewish dietary law, after Jewish uh, uh, law. Because a lot of requirements are actually are asked by, by these people who come here. So what is a kosher hotel? Exactly, kosher that starts with the food. That um, I'm going to talk about kosher food. I think that's that's a whole chapter for a uh, for, for a lot of sessions. But basically, um, this uh, or Jewish Orthodox people cannot eat in a typical hotel, a typical breakfast room, or in a typical restaurant. So automatically, you now in a kosher hotel, all the products that are served are kosher. That means they do meet the Jewish uh, dietary laws. So there's, no milk, there's no milk and meat uh, mixed together. Uh, the, milk, uh, the meat has been uh, slaughtered according to the Jewish law. The milk has been controlled, and so on. So it's, it's a big chapter, so that's one thing. Other requirements could be that on Saturday, on Shabbat, one is not allowed to, uh, let's say, uh, when it works, or work with electricity, for example, turn on lights, and many of the keys of the modern keys they have uh, they have electronic and magnetic features, so magnetic mm -hmm. key. Uh, this could also be an issue on uh, on Friday night or on, on Shabbat on Saturday, as it's considered work. You use electricity as you create something. The very uh, Religious understanding of the Bible would be as God has rested on the seventh day, also we have to rest and create something or to work with the electricity would be considered work. So then people, these people typically couldn't enter a room, couldn't use this card. Now here is typically a way that um, that solution have been found, that they can use other doors, uh, for example, that are not electronic to enter their rooms on Shabbat. So definitely some hotels have absolutely met these requirements and have found some kind of solution that can work for those. So as again, most of the people would go to an apartment where they can cook themselves and take care of their uh, religious and specific needs. And in many hotels, you see a lot of flexibility. Yes. I would say generally Swiss people or Swiss, uh, in general, Swiss hotels are very hospitable and, and uh, typically try to make whatever is possible to their guests' needs. Jewish guests with uh, guests from other places in the world. So often P uh, solutions are found exactly this way, found um, to, to meet these requirements. Are there many kosher, how many kosher hotels are there in Switzerland? That's a good question. Uh, I think kosher hotels that are fully kosher during the whole year, I wouldn't be looking at only a time of the year if I'm right. Probably one or two. But I mean, you can check on the internet, you're faster than me. I have my computer here. But what happens actually in the world is that, for example, what some um, what can be done is that hotels 
would rent the hotel to a Jewish group, the whole hotel, and they will kosherize it or make it kosher for this certain period where the Jewish guests are here. This has happened in uh, Arosa, Arosa last year, exactly. So then the hotel was kosher for this short amount of time. This okay, perfect, okay. thank you. And so then so the other Roger question about, of... Roger about homogeneous, about the, so what, what, the question was about what is their common denominator, or what is their... Exactly, and then sort of how maybe to divide them, no? sort of is it just the Jews and that's it, or sort of Jewish guests and that's it, or sort of how to get a better idea of maybe of groups within the Jewish community. Wow, well, that is exciting, very complicated. Yeah. Even even for me, actually. Of course, you can start trying to divide by uh, by uh, by country they're from. As this makes a little specific, or where families come from. Most of uh, these Jewish people have back, uh, roots in some of them in ancient Poland, some of them ancient uh, uh, Lithuania. So this is also a tradition that you see them in wearing, for example, different color of socks. But this is very, very much detailed. I think it's, it's, um, their common ground is still much bigger than their diversity within this big group. Their common ground of saying, we want to keep the law as strict as possible. We want to eat as kosher as possible. We need a place to pray. Uh, also, here are differences on how they pronounce certain words when praying. But again, these are the really details. So this would be probably the, the, the biggest differences. Uh, you can come to the boss next time with me. I'll I'll show you the little details. Okay. This summer. Um. Well, maybe you quickly explain. No, what do you do then? If and actually, sort of the the reason why um, we speak about Jewish guests uh, here in the context of intercultural comp competence uh, in a tourism bachelor um, sort of a curriculum. Uh, is the reason also why Jonathan and uh, the Swiss Federation of Jewish Communities in general sort of is, is active, no? because they are precisely during a couple of weeks, really, um, there's a considerable number of Jewish guests, no? like in, in Davos, in, mainly in July, August. It's, it's typically the day after Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is a Jewish holiday, it's a burning day um, for the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, this year it's going to be in, I think, 31st or 30th of July. The Jewish calendar is uh, lunisolar, so it's always adapts to the moon and to the, to the sun, so it's not always the same date. But typically, people would come three weeks after this uh, to Shabbat, which this year is going to be, it's going to start end of July until about mid of August. It's about what we think would be most important. And then, what do you do if you come to Dallas? What do we do about our job? Exactly. Exactly. So, if, why do you come? Why, why, why do we come? <laughs> um, let's say, that although most of the cases, most of the situation has worked perfectly without us, as I said, hotels are flexible, people are flexible. So, typically, people find each other. It's a tourism, it's a business, so people find each other. But still, there were unfortunately some little issues uh, during the last years. There has been one specific big case that happened in Narosa with the swimming pool which was probably you were aware of this case where this was a, unfortunately very bad communication between the local and the, the Jewish guests. It was a very good meant idea of saying, people please uh, take a shower before going to the bath because some people, well, some of the Jewish guests didn't uh, obey this law. And then of course the woman wrote down, please take a shower. And of course it's not very sensitive to ask Jewish people to take a shower. This, Unfortunately, also remembers many to what happened uh, 80 years ago. So this was a perfect example of people who have very good intention, but unfortunately there have been some miscommunication. So good intention was seen wrong. And this was also for us, the, let's say, the, the route to just react, to say, oh, we need to do something. There is a miscommunication, apparently. Um, people want to understand each other, but maybe we can help out. And I think we are probably the one who who can do it, as we are very much aware of, we're all born Swiss, we know uh, the Swiss culture very well, we also speak the local language, but we're also aware of, let's say, the needs or how the, the religious Orthodox Jewish people think and, and what their needs are. So that's how we started two years ago with kind of a pilot, we just came here uh, to SAS and to here for some days to help a little bit out. 
uh, answer question. And since last year, we started institutionalizing it by having really people from, from us coming to these places, the Rosa Rosa, South, South Grund, and the uh, Egravin, to stay here for three weeks and really be here on the spot. And sort of what concrete uh, issues can arise, and sort of what, what um, the SEG, Jonathan, and his colleagues, sort of what they do in order to solve possible problems, and sort of that's going to be um, the topic of. Uh, of the session we will have exactly. at what time? Right after uh, 12 o'clock, right? Exactly, we're going we're to speak about some specific cases that have arised several times. I'm quite curious to see what your answer would be to these uh, cases, how you would react to them. I will show you what we, we've done, but uh, let's see how creative we are together. Okay, now, um, what more questions? Uh, Lots of questions. Are there any differences? Uh, sorry, it takes me a little bit of time to. <laughs> there are many questions, which is absolutely great, but also the challenges sort of to challenging to to keep track. So there, that was Marie, Roger, and then are there possibilities? Uh, Ask Simona Schurpf. No, are there possibilities to educate Swiss local people, and maybe uh, that's the thing. No, it's not just like Swiss local people, because in the end, sort of Jewish people can also be Swiss, right? But sort of, yeah, but the local people in general, in Davos and other uh, places, sort of, what, what ways are there to, to educate them about Jewish culture? Mm -hmm. And actually, do you think sort of there's enough being done, maybe not just by you, but also um, uh, in school, for instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Simona. Um, you know, generally, there's always this question, uh, many people even say here, I don't need to be educated about the Jewish people because uh, this is my country and people who come to this country have to adapt to our laws. And there is the same attitude also on the other side. Some guests say, I'm a tourist, I spend money, I can do whatever I want. So people need to, I can just behave the way I am, I have to behave. And yes, the overwhelming majority still, and this is exactly the good thing, are definitely interested in learning about their guests out of different reasons, of course. Some because of their general interests, some some of making more uh, making a better business. Um, so there is indeed this this question. Now, how, how can you so how can you be educated about about uh, about other people about other culture? Today, a lot of things happen during uh, throughout the internet. I saw it a lot, and many people here before, uh, for example, Jewish guests, guests come. They just read online about well, how what are their law, what are their requirements, how they think, what are their holidays. This is one thing. And the other thing is actually one of the biggest things we've done last summer was really answering questions. The question of people who are generally interested, who wanted to know, who were maybe a bit afraid of asking the Jewish guests directly things, who would ask us, why did the Jews do this? Or why do they do that? So that we can answer them. They feel more, um, let's say, more comfortable in asking us. So I think there is indeed a, a need. And generally, I believe, but that's my personal opinion, there definitely has to be done more in schools, all over the world, by the way, but speak about Switzerland. I believe today in our globalized world, it's extremely important to have at least basic knowledge of as many religion cultures uh, possible. So I think definitely should be done more. I already know that today in schools, they learn much more about religions and culture than when I was at school many, many years ago. So, but I definitely believe it's an extremely important subject, intercultural understanding and just learning more about the other because this is a reality today. Whether you're interested, even if you're not interested, it's better for your career. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you as a SEG, do you target really 
sort of with your educational office in a way? Do you target specifically um, tourism providers, professionals, or also the wider public in Davos? You're not all the SaaS target. Well, gener generally, we're open to everybody, of course. Uh, many people just on the street, uh, let's say the classical uh, inhabitant of Davos or Sastal would come and ask questions because it's interest. So we're happy to answer these questions. Now, when you ask about who we're targeting, of course, we have a general interest in uh, people being, um, being not afraid of asking questions. I think that's the highest thing. People are just not afraid and feel comfortable of asking questions. Now, when we talk about this project, of course, let's say the main target of this project were many people here who work or we are engaged with English guests on one side. We're focusing on the, on the local community, on those who rent apartments, those who work at the, at the station. They are just in touch every day in summer with these Jewish guests, so there are a lot of questions on one side. But we, the same way, we have also targeted the, the Jewish guests who come from abroad. Because I, we also believe, um, see, it's a, it's a bit our attitude. Of course, we say, um, as a local, it's in your interest to learn more about your guests. But also, as a guest, it's your interest to learn more about the country you come. So we're also targeting a lot of the Jewish guests that come, that come here. We went to them and, and explained them more about Swiss customs, Swiss culture, for example, greeting persons on the street, which is completely unknown, uh, even in other countries, by the way. So this was a typical example, we're also going to talk later about it. Um, yeah, we were definitely targeted, actually everybody, we're happy to share knowledge and to speak to everybody, but for this project, specifically targeted were the local people here who deal or are in nature the Jewish people and the guests who come from abroad. Thank you. Maybe we take one, two more questions and then uh, make a first break. Um, Alex, is it possible to ask questions via microphone? Um, yes, it is. Is it a question sort of that relates directly to what we just heard? Um, it's actually a general question about um, Jewish guests and families. Okay, well, switch on your, your uh, camera <laughs> and like, then please ask, yes, like this sort of, uh, we, Jonathan, hi. Jonathan, hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, no, right. Yes, <laughs> Very good. Um, we actually we were wondering um, how you deal with um, Jewish people and big families because they actually travel within the family um, and they like to spend um, time um, with their family. Like if they. Um, if they want to find any activities, um, they want to have their children there who can maybe play in the, I don't know, anywhere. And maybe they are mostly a little bit louder. And Swiss people, as you said before, they tend to be um, like in the evening, they like the city to be quiet or the village to be quiet. What are possible areas of conflict um, when dealing with Jewish families in public spaces? Like this is the actual question. Good question. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Indeed, this has been uh, seen. <coughs> sorry, seen and asked several times last year. It mainly happened on playground of kids. Um, so exactly, when Jewish family who typically also come together, several families together with their kids. We have about twenty kids. We just go to one playground, and yes, some people felt, oh, this is, uh, this is not my playground anymore. Now all these Jewish kids come and take away my, my space. And indeed, some people felt uncomfortable here. Um, this is too much, they're too much, they're overtaking the place. Um, I believe that's sad. This is very sad, this attitude. I really believe people saw it too much as a threat instead of an opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the, the moms with uh, their. Uh, the local moms of the kids were a bit, uh, felt a bit uh, uncomfortable when all the Jewish kids came. So I told the moms, well, send your kids to play with them. They're not going to bite. They, they play football the same way you play football. Uh, they like to, to climb the same way your child likes to climb. Just, just try it out. Don't be afraid of them. They're not going to eat you. And, and indeed, so indeed, there is a bit this, uh, <laughs> it's a bit unusual to have so many people coming just uh, at one time. 
The same thing with noise. It's uh, also an issue. In Switzerland, we have this clear law of not well up to 10 o'clock. And uh, now if you have some families and you're loud, uh, people, not only in Jewish, I think people in other countries, in Mediterranean countries, are louder than here. People speak louder. People go to, spe uh, to sleep later. Um, and many people are probably not aware of that. But in Switzerland, it's part of a law that after 10 o'clock, you should be a bit more quiet. It's something you can communicate. It's something that there were some indeed some issues, but this is something which is easy to handle. And you could just say in Switzerland there is a law after 10 o'clock, please be a bit more quiet. Uh, maybe don't sing too loud if you are having a celebration, just keep it a bit uh, lower. And then the uh, solution was not. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I saw in the brochure of the SIG that you um wrote something about the noise uh so i think it is important to to just communicate with the jewish guests how swiss are and how they want the guests to be so i think this is a good combination between maybe talking to um to the enterprises to the hotels to the local community but also to the jewish guests who come to switzerland like so they can maybe act a little bit different than they do at home. I completely agree. But again, probably, this is definitely, definitely not a, a Jewish thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I've lived in Greece for half a year. And there you party at 3 o'clock in the morning and police will be, not even come out for that. Because mm -hmm. the police are saying, they, my neighbors are loud, the police would say, shut up. Uh, no, it's, I think it's a very Swiss thing. It's the strictness of at 10 o'clock you should be quiet. Um, so I think this is something you have to inform any other kind of people from uh, from all over the world. This is right. thing people are definitely not aware so much than, uh, than here. Yeah. And now you, you mentioned, uh, and I also mentioned uh, the importance of community. Uh, uh, if sort of um, if Orthodox Jews who speak with the groom are those sort of that um, that in a way calls most um, demand or requirements in terms of communication. Uh, where do they come from? How can you, what languages usually um, can you talk to them? Sort of, are most of them from the US and you speak English or from Israel as well? Or sort of, what are the languages people need to speak in order to be able to communicate with them? You can all learn Yiddish. It's a language, a mixture between uh, Hebrew with German and Slavic uh, words. So you can learn that language, it's quite a nice language, by the way. And this is definitely the language that everybody understands. Mm -hmm. the Orthodox or Haredi, it's another word we can use, Haredim, religious Haredim guests, um, Yiddish. Probably all of them speak Yiddish, that's the one thing. Then everybody, almost everybody understands either Hebrew, and it would be not here, obviously, but any English. Most of them do have a quite, have a good English, good command of English. In terms of nationality, we have, of course, some Orthodox guests coming from Switzerland, but they speak German, so these are also other people that, that are having any intercultural issues because they uh, know the language and the culture. But in terms of uh, countries, most of them are, I would say a lot of them are from Israel, US, and Benelux states, so Belgium, mainly Belgium, Antwerp. These are probably the biggest groups, then some from England as well. Right, what I would say, but again, for the exact numbers, we could ask the Nokia or the other experts. It would be what I, I estimate. So, um, thank you, Alvin, for this question. Thank you, very much. thank you too. For this little dialogue. And um, let's make a break, um, which uh, gives you time to um, relax a little bit, you often as well. And I can sort of, uh, I have a few minutes to scan the questions uh, you wrote in the chat and we'll resume at 11.15, okay? Thank you. See you in a bit. See you later. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Michel, for being with us today as well. Um, Pascal Lutti asked um, what importance sort of the distinction, the, but basically what importance gender has, right? So that we have this um, there are several cultural theories uh, we sort of we, we discussed in class how to describe, understand, analyze a culture. And one dimension, so-called dimension, is masculinity, masculinity, 
versus femininity, which means that you have cultures uh, that are rather masculine, which means not only rather dominated by men, but also sort of with very clear gender roles, sort of it's clear who does what according to the gender. How, and then obviously, for instance, one consequence in Swiss tourism would be that if um, a family from uh, an Arab uh, country, say if a family from Saudi Arabia or the United Emirates, no, comes to a Swiss hotel, you would not sort of greet the woman, but um, the man, the father, as head of the family. And um, how important is that dimension um, with Jews? Thanks a lot for the question. I guess it's important to face here that we're talking about Jewish religious guests. Most of the Jews actually visiting hotels or being tourists, they don't care at all. But the certain group we are having here, the one you really see that they are Jewish and they're practicing, they do have different roles in gender. It means there is a role for a man and a role for a woman. Actually, the roles are not like the woman is in a weaker position than the man. That's totally not the case. But in order of duties, Men and women have some different work, actually. Mm -hmm. And in order uh, to talk about tourism, the most important thing is actually the physical contact. It's not common in Jewish orthodoxy that a man giving a hand to a woman and they are not married. But it doesn't mean that if you are welcoming guests, you can welcome as well woman as a man or a man as a woman. Mm -hmm. Physical contact is something it's not usual in Jewish orthodoxy. So you wouldn't you wouldn't shake hands with a with an orthodox woman? But you can for instance look her into the eyes, that's not a problem? A absolutely, absolutely. There are probably some uh, who has a, has a problem with it. But it's not based on Judaism, it's more based on their personal uh, views of the world. Jonathan already told that there are Jews coming from all over the world, so they influence also in their culture. But in a Jewish Orthodox way, saying hello and to have a direct look at their eyes isn't a problem. It's really about physical contact, normally. Okay. Speaking about sort of uh, direct communication, somebody else, uh, Amy Neuhaus, she asked um, how Jewish guests communicate, because um, sort of another dimension of uh, cultures is high context versus low context, which means that in high context communication, um, Communication is rather indirect, is very non-verbal, is not explicit. Um, this leads to the fact, for instance, that um, people from high context cultures like China, sort of um, people would hesitate also to criticize me, to voice, to voice um, uh, discontent if they are not happy, sort of they, they, they would sort of have some pain in, in, in articulating and voicing that. Whereas there are other cultures, especially, say, for us, already the Germans have a rather direct way of communicating. Uh, US Americans maybe even more. If they're not happy, they would tell you straight away. In general, how would you say, how do Jewish people communicate? A good question. Uh, not that easy to give an answer. So I can answer it just uh, with my uh, knowledge, as I was here uh, last summer. Here again, it's not about religion. It's much more about their uh, countries they are from. Like there are two big groups here in Davos. There's the Israeli uh, mentality and the US American. In general, I saw that people like to communicate a lot. Uh, means they're having a lot, a lot of 
questions, they really, if they are interested in a certain topic, especially in tourist office, they ask and they take the opportunity to ask. The Swiss one thinks, I have 10 questions, but it's not nice to ask them more than three, not of wasting their time. Mm -hmm. uh, Israeli or an American, they see uh, there is a, an office, they're answering the question, so I take the opportunity and ask everything I want to ask, yeah. even about weather of tomorrow or how to react uh, with an intercultural relation with a cow uh, at the farm, so they ask everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> but interestingly, it's Judaism is based in European culture, so the, it's a verbal communication, but also a European one. I guess some people from India or China, they have having, from cultural ways, different ways of communicating. So Orthodox Jews are actually living in European or American-based context. It also influenced their way of communicating. In that sense, uh... Uh, it, there are still differences also within Western cultures, obviously, yes. but all in all, Western cultures are sort of rather low context cultures, cultures where um, direct verbal communication is important. And we would say sort of that's the same in that sense with uh, Jewish guests that come to, to Switzerland. Absolutely. And the special, like culture wise, more like American style or Israeli style. Uh, which for our standards are rather more, more active, uh, you can imagine with an Italian or a temperament instead of Swiss being nice or a German being straight ahead all the point. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, Stefania had two questions. Uh, on the one hand, uh, she asked sort of how um, sort of how difficult, challenging it is to mix um, guests from Jewish culture, and I would say Orthodox Jews in that sense, um, for whom um, kosher food uh, and, and other uh, kosher measures sort of are important, with um, people from other cultures, sort of how, how challenging is that? Um, and then referring to um, the pool situation in Arosa, um, Stefania said, well, sort of, this is generally known, sort of, what the rules are for a, for a public pool. Um, sort of, how, who has to adapt more? I guess, sort of, Stefania, sort of, the way I read your question was you felt that, sort of, it was rather the hotel that had to adapt rather than the guests. Um, write to me if I'm wrong. Maybe you can start with with uh, with the first question, sort of mixing guests from um, from different cultures, how challenging is that for a hotel? Okay, mixing guests—it's anyway a, a subject. It's not that easy. Like as I'm a tourist, sometimes I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit nervous about Americans and the way how they communicate. So it's actually the same with Orthodox Jews and other guests. A lot of people actually don't have a problem with different cultures so they can live together without a problem. Uh, Jonathan told about the situation on a playground. If you're having a Jewish family with 10 children and then there is a, a, a German family with two children and they feeling overwhelmed uh, from the numbers of children feeling that they are not able to use the playground or they have to wait longer because the group of, uh, of Jewish people are so big. So that's actually every time uh, if you have different cultures, especially other tourists are not used to it, it's every time a little bit tricky. And you have to be on one side listening to the other guests, on the other side you will be a good host. Jewish guests as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she specified, Stefania, that it's really about the buffet, also the kitchen. I mean, they're sort of, you cannot really mix, no? it's either or. Sort of, if, if you offer a kosher buffet, uh, 
uh, kosher cuisine in general, sort of, um, you cannot sort of, it's either or in that sense, right? So, okay, there is not that many places like Bokeh's kosher bar. So uh, the most of the tourists here, the Orthodox tourists here, they're having their own apartment and they cook for their own. But if there is a, a kosher buffet, you move the close to sure. Ask. <laughs> if there is a kosher buffet, uh, it's no problem for some non-Jewish guests to eat as well. The Orthodox Jews are not allowed to eat from a non-kosher buffet, but as a non-Jew, you can eat it uh, without a problem. Mm -hmm. So there are sometimes maybe that's the, a stupid question, but would I notice whether it's kosher or not? Do, do I notice that, or sort of? If you're yours in a in a in a breakfast to eat your uh, pork, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you will notice. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, the, the products are like bread, uh, cheese, mm -hmm. and honey, mm -hmm. and butter. It's actually mostly the same. It's okay. the way of conducting mm -hmm. uh, the things. It's different, but okay. the food as such, the, the flavor is sort of not really. And maybe if you're having an Israeli style uh, breakfast, yeah, sure. then you're having a little bit more Mediterranean ish, Slato sure. for Rushki, yeah. but it's the way of producing food and not the food as such, mostly. Yeah. Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the, the second part of the question on, by Stefania was sort of the, the, the adapting. I was sort of, do you. Um, Jonathan already mentioned sort of that you also, um, that in the end, the guests that come to Switzerland are also in a way targeted by you, are also a target group of yours. Um, do you think in general sort of, yeah, how adaptable are they? Do you, do you feel sort of that there is, is progress also being made do you, do you feel sort of that it's really not just the hosts that learn and adapt but also the guests that learn and adapt we went here for like three weeks and i wasn't sure what will happen like last year if the people are willing to listen if they're adapting but actually totally surprised for me 100 percent of the people i talked with were were interested in Swiss culture. And a lot of people perhaps don't know that you say everyone, you're crossing someone on the street, you say hello. Actually, as a, uh, someone who grew up in Zurich, you are also not used to do it on the street because people are thinking you're stupid if you do it. But here it's the tradition to say hello to people who are cr uh, crossing you on the street. And if you tell it to uh, some Orthodox people, they are very, very interested in those, uh, those, those po points and they are taking it up. And a lot of people from the walls told me that it's a rising of saying hello on the street with this uh, other question about the buff in the Arosa actually communicating is the way to achieve all that people are feeling well. You have to talk with people. You're not in the way, you should not be too Swiss to not telling what's actually normal here in Switzerland. It's nothing bad if you're telling, like in a bath, we are looking for a hygienical standard, so please don't uh, swim with a bodysuit, or if you are here in Davos, asking the people to buy uh, the garbage. That's something very special in Switzerland. No one is paying for the garbage, except the Swiss people. But a lot of Jewish Orthodox uh, guests don't know the Swiss culture. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to forget that we are not a neutral-based people, that we have our tradition, like with being loud, at which time do you have to be quiet in the evening? We're having our own tradition. And the people from the US or from Israel, they don't know it. And if you tell them, you won't have a problem at most of the places. The garbage, um, 
is, is an interesting topic because uh, I, I imagine also um, in general um, tourists that travel in big families, um, Orthodox Jews, certainly also Indian people, certainly also um, guests from the GCC, they often rent apartments. And I guess uh, sort of the, the rubbish bag thing uh, and sort of the fact that you have to pay to dispose it uh, properly uh, is, is certainly a challenge, not just uh, in general for, for people that rent an apartment rather than um, going uh, to the hotel, right? Um, thank you so much for these answers. Another question, uh, two other questions uh, by Yasmin Hador were on the one hand, um, is it necessary for a hotel to offer a public prayer room or is that not necessary? And the second question refers to the complaint behavior. How do Jews uh, complain? Sort of the, the reason why uh, Yasmin asked is because, again, sort of uh, we, we realize now that um, for a hotel, in a way, it's easier to have US American guests um, uh, when it comes to complaining because sort of they give you the chance to react. Sort of, they are not happy, they tell you immediately and sort of, maybe that's not just, um, how should I say, pleasant, but at least you can react in time. Whereas um, with uh, people sort of, who are sort of inhibited in a way to complain upfront, they might do that afterwards, sort of writing a bad review. So, um, yeah. On first sort of pray room, yes or no, is sort of is that a requirement? And second, sort of how do um, how would you describe sort of the complaint behavior by uh, by Jewish guests? Thanks also for this question uh, about prayer room. It depends what you want to offer. If you want to be attractive for Jewish Orthodox guests, having a special uh, product for the Jewish guests to try to bring them more in your hotel. Therefore, it would be nice because Jewish or as Orthodox Jews, they are praying three times a day. And they pray in a group. So a prayer room would be quite helpful. Here in Davos, you have several prayer rooms they rent uh, by themselves. But as a hotel, if you have your own prayer room, it's very attractive for Jewish guests. And if you're not focusing on this target group, uh, you don't need to do it. If they are uh, still coming and using your infrastructure. It's a question about your uh, structure and your wishes, what you want to achieve. The second uh, question about the complaining. Most of the uh, Jewish Orthodox guests are like Israeli or US American, so they are quite happy. They even complain if there is something small. They are complaining, but not with a bad uh, feeling. They just uh, something I don't like. Go and tell it to change it. It doesn't mean that they will hate a total situation, the hotel. It's just, just the mentality of being open in communication. And in such things, Jewish Orthodox. Uh, Guests are very easy going because they do complain and they take the opportunity to complain. But you even as a, a tourist a worker you can complain also with them. It's not mm -hmm. the way that they taking like it personal. Yeah, yeah. They take you can uh, be mm -hmm. more direct with Jewish Orthodox guests as you are with Swiss guests, probably. Um, one Another dimension which has to do with uh, complaint behavior also is um, individualism versus collectivism. Now, there are cultures that are more individualist, which um, really sort of characterizes a, a culture by the fact that individual freedom is sort of um, key and sort of individual freedom comes first in a way. And there are collectivist cultures where it's much more about the group and uh, it's much more about social harmony. So obviously, um, in a collectivist culture where it's all about social harmony, you feel more inhibited in a way to, to, to complain because sort of you don't want to disturb in a way the, the social harmony. 
Um, now, on the one hand, uh, how would you describe uh, Orthodox Jews or sort of culture of Orthodox Jewish culture? You know, like on the one hand, the group is very important because precisely there are certain rituals you can only do as a group. They travel also in big families. And on the other hand, sort of they have a very direct way of communicating also of saying, uh, expressing if they are not happy. What would you say sort of it's, what is more important, social harmony or individual freedom? Uh, a heavy question. I guess it's a mixture between both aspects. Individual freedom, it's not in the democracy. So it's a typical Swiss uh, uh, feeling of being nice to have as less problems as possible. But as we're told, uh, group and uh, group feelings are for Orthodox Jewish uh, people very important as they live directly every time in groups. That makes, by the way, uh, the situation now with coronavirus very hard for Jewish Orthodox uh, uh, groups and families because they are used to stay with a lot of people, with their family, and the family are sometimes over 50 people. They are in the community, they are very social. But the way of communication, it's in the tradition of being direct, because in Jewish tradition, it was every time hard to get on the point and to fight against all the, the problems they are facing. So the way of communication is direct, direct, but not in a way of confronting. That's not the goal to achieve having a, a, a fight. It's much more the, the, uh, the way they're growing up with their historical background. Do you know what I mean? Therefore, I say it's like a mix between harmony and being a more passive way, the way of being direct and individualized. But would you say then sort of social harmony within the group is important, but to the outside sort of there is sort of you express clearly what you like and what you don't like, sort of in that sense sort of Harmony within the group is important. Harmony to the outside is not that important. I don't would tell it in this way because the, the fight in the group is sometimes much bigger than. Uh, okay. So they try to behave. If you're they talking with uh, people that don't know the traditions, they are much more nice than talking with their own family or with, with their friends in the group. So they try in that way. Be harmonic, but not in a in a, in a Swiss way, mm -hmm. not in a, in a Swiss way with a, a lot of uh, barriers. Mm -hmm. That's okay. actually the uh, yes. Okay. Um, Sarah Schneeberg asked sort of how um, there are different movements. She wrote, um, I guess, sort of uh, yeah, that refers to more orthodox, less orthodox, uh, less religious Jews, sort of. How do they behave among each other? Um, sort of, how would you say, like, is it, is it, um, and somebody else, uh, I don't recall uh, who wrote the question, sort of, in general, how do Jewish guests, uh, sort of, do they mind, especially religious Jewish guests, do they mind being with other non Jewish guests in a hotel or not? And maybe, sort of, the, the question could be in general, a sort of, What's the relationship? How easy or difficult is the relationship in, in a destination like Davos between Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews on the one hand and between, um, say, um, Orthodox or non-Orthodox Jews with, with non-Jews? Sort of, what is, is it, is it sort of, would, would maybe the same issues that can arise between the local population in Davos and Orthodox Jews, could the same issue also arise between um, non-religious Jews and Orthodox Jews? Sort of, could they, sort of, what, what's the relationship? Is it sometimes e difficult also between, within, say, Jewish, the Jewish community, between Orthodox and non-Orthodox groups? Or sort of, is there no problem? Probably the relationship between non-Jews and Orthodox Jews, it's much easier uh, to 
describe. So I uh, will start with this and then I come to the subject choose and choose together. Uh, with right. the relationship between choose and non choose, actually, most of the complaints are against choose. The choose are actually not that complaining with Swiss people. They actually much, are much more harmonic with the Swiss people uh, living around than the Swiss people are with them. Mm -hmm. so be, uh, I, I guess because as a tourist you think, ah, oh, it's very interesting to see something else. Uh, it's not a, big, uh, not a big deal, they are special, but uh, I don't care. But in the way uh, about the relationship that Orthodox Jews they are quite more open than you think. Like in praying and the religious stuff, they like to stay with their own. But in the way of communication, you won't go to a, a place actually with majority of non Jews. You're having like barriers in relation with non Jews. So they, are, they are know that they are in a relation. Even with uh, sometimes I saw a Davos Lake, some discussion between women, non Jewish women, and Jewish mother uh, about uh, all the subject they were like talking for hours there. So it's to generalize it, it's quite hard. There are probably some of them who want to stay separately, but a lot, especially the Americans, as you know, the American mentality are quite open. They don't care. Religious thing, we do it separately, but uh, uh, me, uh, meetings up at the streets of Davos isn't important. More interesting actually are the relations between Jews and Jews. Uh, as Jonathan uh, start with a joke that there are two Jews and three opinions, that's in a way the same of relationship between different ways of Judaism. Sometimes Orthodox Jews and perhaps liberal Jews they are not, you know, they are having quite of uh, uh, points not in common in order of uh, language. So that means that some of the Orthodox Jews don't accept liberals, and liberals think uh, think they are living in a in a totally different world uh, than they are. So actually, because they are related to each other as Jews. They are much more critical with each other. So if I'm as a non-black suited uh, going into the streets and I observe a situation I don't like, and I think that they doing a bad behavior, I personally feel uh, touched. So I'm much more in than if it's totally not my business. Mm -hmm. As it's you feel that, affected in a way. Right? Absolutely, and as the relationship is uh, still there, they, they are much more arguing about different uh, point of views. So sometimes it's actually more difficult to mediate between different Jewish groups than with Jews and non Jews. Okay, I think that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, had to do with spontaneity. How spontaneous are uh, Jewish guests in general? Do they plan their stay, their travel very much in detail and uh, in advance? Or do they simply come here and then really decide on the spot what to do? As well, a very good question, as it, there is like two sides of the, the answer. Like, in terms of preparing for the trip, with all the religious rules and Shabbat, that means or Saturday, you have to be organized by and well. If you have to bring your own stuff from at home, at which times uh, Shabbat is starting, where are the prayer rooms, so you have to be very, very well organized. But uh, in question of what they're actually doing for activities, they are very, very spontaneous. They are don't, and sometimes they don't have a clue. If they are uh, going for a, an attraction, sometimes people don't know actually what it is. They are not that informed. It's like the, in this way of 
doing their daily uh, activities, they are much more up, showing up what's what's happening, and then pick it up what may interest me. So then you have both elements being very, very well uh, prepared for the, the journey, and some are very, very spontaneously decide what they want to do. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question by Stefania. Um, according to our information, in some regions in Switzerland, there are hotels which focus on Jewish guests only. Um, do they welcome, um, now where did it go? Do they welcome other guests as well? And would such guests um, feel comfortable? Um, I think sort of part of the answer was already given. Um, there are very few. Um, hotels that are, for instance, kosher, and there are very few hotels that really uh, sort of specialize in Jewish guests, and maybe like the one in Narosa. Is in Narosa that was the Kuln, no? It was, Kuln, yeah. uh, it was a Kuln hotel in Narosa. Sort of there, they would really rent the whole hotel to Jewish guests for a couple of weeks. Um, but as as sort of and 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 other hotels that do not specialize um, on Jewish guests or that do not welcome only Jewish guests, but sort of a mixed mixed sort of um, group of, of guests from all over the world. Yeah, sort of. You you would say you would say that um, sort of the, the 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 challenge is much more for the Jewish who need to. Uh, or who want to, to eat kosher and sort of um, uh, sort of follow certain rules, but for the other guests, really sort of that that uh, whether sort of the other guests follow the same rules or not does not really matter to the Jewish guests, right? Uh, absolutely. Maybe in this question, if you as a non Jew feeling uh, good uh, in a Jewish hotel with a majority of guests with Holocaust background. Depends on your way, how open you are. All those questions with clean, noisy, a lot of children, it's depending on how you want to spend your vacation. It's not the experience of being in a typical Swiss hotel uh, at the Paradeplatz in Zurich. You will have a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a question of being welcome, it's just a question of all overwhelming to stay in Switzerland in a totally different culture. Okay, so I guess it really depends <laughs> on who actually stays in this hotel. Um, okay, there's another question. Uh, two more questions. Lilia Corte asks, how do Jews book their holidays? Are there any Jewish tour operators? specialized for Jewish travelers, or do they book um, online and inform about the hotel, um, about their needs beforehand, or do they even only book kosher hotels? But basically, sort of the, the booking behavior, how, how, um, yeah, like, what's, what's the typical booking behavior? Do they um, book via specialized um, tour operators and travel agencies? Or sort of is that very much individual as well? That would be one question um, by Lidia Corte and Halden Hassan asks, coming back to high and low context communication, Jews have a rather Western communication, yes, but do, um, and she asks sort of whether you see also some similarities to Arab speaking Jews. Um, or rather, sort of between Arab speaking Jews and and Arab culture, sort of because in the end it's very true. No, sort of Jews that live in, in Israel, sort of they are very much also um, in, both in touch with Western cultures. But they are also in touch with sort of the Arab world. So maybe let's let's start with uh, the booking behavior, <laughs> and then move on sort of to Jews from Israel being in a way between the two worlds. The booking behavior, I guess, uh, during the year, if uh, Orthodox Jewish guests are going for a vacation or a business trip to Zurich, they 
do it by the book. Because they're like a businessman or either a family, but not in that big group that they are organized. So most of the bookings during the year, if you have a Jewish guest, whatever you are, they are doing by themselves. They know the all the platforms and even they know by different information where is their kosher hotel or like a hotel in can organize some kosher food. In Zurich, uh, the, the, uh, the Sheraton, it's, they, they know how to deal with a uh, Orthodox guests, especially if you're organizing a kosher breakfast. Here in Davos, I guess it's different. As the numbers of Jewish guests are that high, there are operators besides it. Even with the scene, if they arrive in, a big, uh, uh, in big cars or even uh, buses, they are organized. Also, they are organized in a way of organizing the prayer rooms, booking the total. Hell. So, the voice is something special in this, uh, in this question because the numbers are so high that the organization behind it is bigger than if you are like a private uh, visitor. The second question uh, what similarities do Arab guests choose to have? Probably there are relations between Jewish guests and Arab guests, especially the non-Orthodox people from Israel. Mentality is similar, uh, they would like to see more food, uh, they like to talk, they like to complain, it's a, it's a Middle Eastern way of behavior. But the strong Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, people are much more based traditional Polish uh, way of uh, dealing with things. Even if they are living in Israel, they are living separately, and they are very, very strong with their Eastern European uh, relations in Chip. So the mentality of the Middle East don't actually arrive at the Orthodox uh, quarters in Jerusalem or uh, near to Tel Aviv. It's still like a small town in sometimes okay right um, well to me at least uh, that last point was, was really interesting that sort of uh, yeah even though even though we, we, we associate in a way uh, obviously Judaism and especially also Orthodox um, Judaism with uh, with Israel um, sort of or then with with the US sort of that that in a way their way of, of communicating and in general uh, Big part of their culture, in a way, still has to do with um, where many, many of them used to live in in Eastern Europe, especially in Poland. Um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. So, thank you so much, um, Michel. There, you're interesting. We make a break. It's five to twelve. Let's make a break of fifteen minutes, and we continue at twelve ten with very um, concrete issues uh, regarding tourism. And maybe Jonathan, before uh, we start the break. Do you want to mention just sort of four or five key issues that have arisen in the last couple of years? Um, and sort of please think about these issues. What could be the problem and what could be possible solutions, right? So what are just sort of the Great, keywords? so let's, let's bring some keywords so you have something to think of during, during the break. Uh, one thing, one case so I would like to talk to you is about this greeting culture in Switzerland. Another thing is going to be about when renting an apartment, uh, how you can handle it back. So about the cleanness of handling back an apartment. I'd like to talk about using about consumption, restaurants and toilets. You should have to pay for a toilet or not. In specific, uh, in restaurants, maybe in the mountains. Uh, maybe also about behavior in supermarkets. What could, there could be there some, some things that have happened. I'll add it to your imagination and we'll discuss it after the break. Great. See you in a bit at 12.10. So, welcome back, dear students. Um, we have been joined by Jean-Pierre Gallet, whom you see on my right-hand side. Uh, he will talk to you um, together with Jonathan Chopik about concrete 
I stand here, hoping that you can, hoping that you can at least hear me well. Uh, Jean-Pierre and Jonathan, they have been working together um, here in Davos um, for some time now. And sort of the, the, the purpose of the next 50 minutes is to talk precisely about concrete issues that can have arisen here in Switzerland, uh, here in Davos, but also elsewhere, um, three problems and what has been done. Um, Jean-Pierre Gallet is head of guest relations of the Davos uh, destination organization. And actually he has together with Jonathan been very, very helpful sort of in organizing this whole excursion. So Jean-Pierre, thank you so much for being with us, for helping and for um, talking to um, our students. So I would say I give you um, word, Jean-Pierre, if, if you want to start off sort of with uh, uh, yeah, describing briefly uh, what you do, how important Jewish guests are uh, here in Davos. You said already uh, a very important and interesting figure, 95% of Jewish guests um, here in Davos, they stay in apartments. 95% stay in apartments and only 5% in hotels. So I think that's already a very interesting figure. And I hope um, John Pierre will be able to share some more information with us. So um, we have 50 minutes until one o'clock before the lunch break. Um, I hope you enjoy and please keep on interacting the way you have already. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello together. My name is Jean Pierre Gallet. As I mentioned, I'm head of the guest relations here in Davos and Closters. Since we have a lot of uh, Jewish people, especially during the summer, that means especially in August, nearly uh, three or four weeks, we have uh, about, let's say, in the peak, there are uh, 5,000 people who are staying in our destination, more in the host than in Klosters. And during this time, uh, it was the last few years, always a discussion, how we can uh, handle uh, these two cultures between Jewish guests and non-Jewish guests. The reason was I met uh, Jonathan uh, one year ago and we discussed about uh, what we can do, how we can explain the situation from one part to the other. That was the reason that we started with the project last summer that some of the Jewish uh, Mittler, uh, like uh, Jonathan or others, are coming to Davos and uh, try to find a way between these two uh, people, let's say the Jewish people, the normal uh, holiday guests, and the people who have it in Davos themselves. So we started uh, a couple uh, of uh, months ago, and uh, there was a, a good idea, we had a good starting. First of all, we had to inform the people from Davos what we are doing, what we prefer to do. And so at least we have found a way. During three weeks, uh, friends of Jonathan uh, are, are staying in Davos. That uh, find a way how can you explain to about the culture of Jewish people and how can you explain uh, the culture of Switzerland to the Jewish people. So I say that was the reason why we started this, this project. And could you maybe quickly tell us sort of how important Jewish guests are in August, especially? They're sort of, would you say, half of all your guests, or one third, or one quarter, or 10% of all your guests are Jewish? Uh, I would say there will be about 10% uh, of our guests during, especially during the and uh, or since we have also uh, kosher hotels in Davos, more Jewish people are, are also here in Davos around the year than we have also in August. Yeah. But at least the peak will be in August, and that would be, would say, about 10%. Thank you so much. So, um, Jonathan, shall we sort of move on to these yes, issues? Yes, to the, to the cases indeed. Um, so, we've been working the last year three weeks here and also the other destinations. And interestingly, we found that there were several cases that happened again and again. 
I thought it would be a nice idea to discuss with you three or four cases that have happened several times and listen to your inputs and also maybe discuss them together how we dealt with the situation. I believe the first one and the most common one is the greeting case. The greeting case, as we call it, inside uh, between us. Now, first a question to you. Can you imagine what could be here an issue when, it's, uh, when uh, any guests arrive from abroad and about a greeting culture in Yeah, are there any ideas? What could be, what could be uh, the trouble with greeting? Actually, sort of, it has already been kind of mentioned. Exactly. Uh, Selena writes, probably the guests don't greet the others. Um, don't greet other guests or don't greet the locals or both? <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. Both. So. What was the concrete? Is that correct? Yeah, and in what situations yeah. do they not greet? Yeah, you know, not only in Switzerland, people uh, always, especially in the mountain, the holiday, they say hello, how are you, and so on. And the people from uh, the Jewish people, they don't know about uh, this culture, you know. The reason, the reason was they do not know. And since we had uh, this project last year, I I had the experience that some of the Jewish people are saying. Grüezi, hello, how are you? That's absolutely a new situation for us and for the other guests. So I'm sharing this great experience. I think it's not only uh, even people in Switzerland who come from the city, like me from Zurich, for even for us it's not common to greet on the street, but it's a beautiful tradition in the mountains that you greet in Switzerland. I personally love it a lot and I was very happy to share this also with the Jewish guests when they came. Say so you could just say hello, or even better, say Grüezi. And the beautiful thing is, they said first of all, but I don't know these people. I say exactly, that's a good, good, nice thing here. It's a safe place. You greet each other. And as Jean-Pierre said, I even felt like after they were even over greeting, uh, <laughs> even a lot. Of, this was a very good experience that happened. That was very happy that this was an easy thing to do, and that was extremely successful here in Davos, but also within the other destinations. That's correct. Yeah. And how important then is sort of the, the communication within the community? Sort of, do you feel you have to do the same thing every year, time and again, or sort of once, uh, sort of the first generation of guests in a way uh, knows sort of about such habits with us? Sort of, does this spread automatically um, among the Jewish guests? You know, what I think um, must be very, very important that we will do it also again and again. I mean, it's, uh, we started last year and uh, we get some good experience, but it's not enough, I think, especially for the people who have it here in the house of Moses. I think we have to try it and uh, we have to do it once again. Uh, let's say our cooperation will start again next summer and so. Uh, for me, it's important that it's like in the school. You have to teach it, teach it, teach it one again, so you get uh, the, at least a good experience finally. Okay. Yep. That was the the greeting. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> sure? also the easiest one. <laughs> and let's move to on to another one that we have seen all over the country. Again, it's not. More specific, it's a very general case. It's about um, when handing out the apartment. So, when you get an apartment, you get a contract, and then you give the apartment back or the key back. And then there have been some issues, a lot of complaints um, towards the Jewish guests saying they're leaving their apartment. So, it's not cleaned up, it's, it's, it doesn't look very, um, it's not clean enough to, according to our standard. So this has been a big issue that we had. Um, first, I think it was also important to understand what happened and why it happened. Why apparently people left the apartment not very clean. Uh, maybe also as a question to you first, to the group. Have you got any ideas where the concept could be here? Or what could be the reason that apparently the apartment wasn't as clean as we expected? Why do you think were there conflicts?
Does anybody want to join in via audio and video? Maybe it's easier than to write. Why could there have been conflicts? Okay, so the one is different standards when it comes to cleanliness. Um, exactly, different definition of what is clean, what is not clean. Maybe because of the Shabbat. Um, sort of that they don't do work on that day. And often actually it's Saturday to Saturday that you rent an apartment. Oh, I mean... I mean, uh, especially Jewish cash, they rent an apartment Sunday to Sunday. Ah, okay. Not Sunday to Sunday. Okay. I could explain why we have this uh, situation. Uh, you know, if you rent an apartment uh, here, for example, in the United States, you, you get the key and you leave it and you leave all uh, the rubbish in the apartment. We call it in Switzerland, base and grind. This means uh, you have to, to wish the apartment, you have to put away the rubbish, and that means basin line, and that's a, a thing that Jewish people have to learn, especially in our part, uh, our country. Also, if you rent an apartment in Switzerland, then you get the key and you give the key back, and you polish uh, the rooms at least, and you put the rubbish away. I think that's the most important thing I discussed that is, uh, with uh, families, with Jewish people. They, did me, uh, they, they told me, listen, I do all that if we rent an apartment abroad and probably you get the key and you give it like it is. That could be one uh, solution to find a way. I think I want to add to that. The biggest misunderstanding, I believe, from my experience in exactly this case was that in the contract, when you rent an apartment, the contract, you have the word Schlusslein, means they will clean. Now, for many people, again, me as a Swiss, I know Swiss standards. So if I go to Switzerland, as Jopnia said, I know Schlussreinigung means I leave it in line, that's enough, and then there will be a professional cleaner who would clean everything well as we like it, you know, with uh, water and to have it on an even higher standard. And the problem was when people read in the contract, plus I go 100, 150 francs, people think, ah, that means I can leave everything there because they will anyway clean it. I have already paid 150 francs for that. So I think this was the biggest misconception here in understanding the contract as Schluss Reinigung includes everything. But this is typically something I have to speak a lot and to explain a lot. That again, Schluss Reinigung means you leave it based by, that's the Swiss standard of leaving an apartment, and then the professional cleaner will come and make it look even better for the next. I think this was the classic issue here, and also the solution to inform them, and to make clear also when the people sign a contract, to make clear Schluss Reinigung means not that you can leave the apartment dirty. And do you have already sort of um, experiences made, sort of? Do you feel okay this measure informing both guests and um, landlords and maybe making changes to the contract sort of has this worked out sort of well? Yeah, you know, at least we uh, last year we produced, or you produced uh, the brochure for the Jewish people and also a brochure for the, for the other people, I mean, especially for the landlords. There was an explanation what you have what you have to tell to the guest what they have to do on the end of their stay. So put the rubbish away, put it in the blue sack, not uh, in another one or outside. That's I think it's a question of uh, experience, a question of uh, how to tell, to tell it to the people what they have to do. Because most of them they do not know, you know. That's the reason why, and uh, I think we are in a, in a good shape that uh, we will produce all of next summer a special uh, fact sheet where we explain once again uh, how to handle the situation. I really think this is extremely important because even sometimes we Swiss people think of it that our standard is a world standard, where everybody's aware of that, but this is just not true. I mean, especially with garbage bag. Switzerland is one of the few countries in the world that do have a exactly strict regulated garbage bag. 
Um, again, I see it myself. I lived in many countries, and the garbage needs to just take a plastic bag to store it outside, and somebody will, will they will pick it up. I think it's also very also also a responsibility here to to make clear to the guests. Listen, you're in Switzerland, and you could, we cannot expect everybody to know about that. Just to explain on a nice way. Listen, this is the standard here. These are only the, you cannot use any bags. You have to use the, uh, it's this specific the rose, uh garbage bag. And then, of course, I mean, I think the experience says the majority of the people are, are, are friendly guests and will, of course, adapt to that as well. And I think, in general, um, when it comes to guests that do not stay in a hotel, like there is just so much more that they can do wrong. Like, if you are in a hotel, you are in a professional setting, and there are many ways that guests can be informed about what to do, not to do, and basically they just do less. And if they are in the para hotelry, especially when they rent an apartment, maybe they rent a, a car, so that they are just much less controlled in a way. You know? And so it's absolutely correct. I mean, also in all that you get the reception desk twenty four hours, and you can ask and. And uh, you get some help, but if you stay in an apartment, you are most of them. You are alone. You know, you sure. get sometimes you get the key uh, uh, behind the door, and that's all. Uh, and you never will really see the landlord. And you just get the contract. And that's correct. What you what you said. I mean, uh, that's the reason why we have to inform more and more and uh, give all the details. So speak, and, uh, the right one. Okay, so that was the garbage issue. That was a big garbage issue, exactly. <laughs> and then we will talk a bit about the restaurants, about consumption. Um, here, also from my experience, what I've seen a lot and heard a lot is that some uh, restaurant managers complained about the Jewish guests, saying, first of all, they're not consuming at all, some of them. And there was the issue of some people apparently ordered. One Coca Cola uh, for a group of five people and just stay there very long. Sometimes even during lunch hour, where other guests wanted, I cannot say other guests wanted, but there were guests who wanted to eat and, of course, spent more money in the restaurants, but apparently the Jewish group was sitting there just having a Coke. This was a typical uh, complaint. Um, and then another thing that I've heard, and this is also quite an interesting thing that happens here in the host, that one told me. Uh, but this is just something I found out when I discussed a bit more. He said, I never understand why the Jewish guests only order one round. Take one drink and then they stay there for hours. And they don't order more. And then I asked him, well, did you, did you ask if they want to consume? And he said, yes, I went there and I said, are you okay? Is everything fine? Now, I think this is another typical Swiss um, understanding that many people from abroad are not aware of that. If we are having, if I'm, if I'm, I'm having a beer with uh, Jean-Pierre and Alex in the bar, and somebody would ask us, is everything okay? But this question do, does not only mean that uh, are you fine, it also means you want to consume something else. It's also an invitation to ask, well, we're going to take another route. And I believe many people are not aware of that. Many people think if somebody asks me, is everything okay? It means, well, literally, is everything okay? It means, well, I can still stay with my coke for the first three hours. This was a, a tiny thing I have experienced here. And I told the guys that maybe next time when you have these Jewish guests ordering one Coke and stay sitting long, but maybe do not ask is everything okay, just ask me more specific. May I uh, offer you a second round? Or may I, uh, may I uh, send you, may I bring a second uh, Coke or beer or whatever? This was a thing that like culturally lit miscommunication, but the bigger issue was mainly the low consumption from the Jewish guests. This was a yeah, that's absolutely correct. But another thing, I think it's very, very important. Uh, some of the Jewish people are coming into a restaurant and ask for the toilet. They use the toilet, they have no drinks, no consumption. That, that's a problem for, for the manager of the restaurant, of the hotel, because uh, they accept that uh, people who come in, in the restaurant and use the toilets, they also order a drink or something else you know i think that's sometimes uh, a problem especially in the in the restaurant so uh, then uh, 
it's a question of misunderstanding. Otherwise, the question is, do you have kosher food? No, we don't have any kosher food. And just want to have a drink or no drink, just want to use the toilet. I think that's that's a problem <laughs> who exists. Everywhere. I think it is not only the host. We, we experience the same in our host side, the SAS Valley. The issue here is, I think, there are two things. One thing is the group, which can sometimes maybe underestimate that the toilet, especially the toilet is around 2,000, 3,000 meters, is uh, just to, to manage this toilet, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, to take everything back and down. It's not as easy as managing, let's say, a public toilet. Ever. And it's not a public toilet. Um, then what, what, what we've done, what we have suggested in uh, some places was, and this is something clear, just to ask for a price for the toilet if people do not consume. You can just write down that the, the use of the toilet costs one franc if, if you do not consume. I don't know if we've done it here, but I know in, in South Valley there was a very good experience. You just communicated it very clear in several languages. This was also understood and accepted. And when you explain to the people that well, the toilet, first of all, is a private toilet, it's not a public toilet. Second of all, the toilet, to maintain the toilet, mainly in the mountains, is not as simple as in a big city. People completely understand it. And it's also fair. It's just fair to, to ask for a price if you do not consume a coffee or, or a Coke or a beer or whatever. So this worked very well in the, the South Valley. I think uh, if this should be an issue here, I think it's completely fair to, to tell the manager you could ask for a price. Or indeed, say a uh, toilet is only available when consuming. I think that's a good idea. I think we have to to inform our our restaurant manager uh, about this uh, situation, and uh, they will tell them that they that to produce a little ship. Uh, it's written down to use our toilet. It costs one pence uh, or it's free of charge if you have a drink. Something. Uh, for the fact sheet for the coming summer. Mm -hmm. that, that's one we can, yeah, we're always adding the fact sheets and the brochure to be something that is developing. Uh, another thing also that we have experienced is, as Jopia said, people ask, do you have something kosher? And the restaurant owner will typically say, no, we don't have any kosher, it's not a kosher restaurant. But here also what we've done, the, um, the mediators, we have told them that, well, indeed, they do have kosher products without them knowing it actually. Because, uh, first of all, all the drinks are kosher by definition. Uh, the coffee is kosher. Maybe not to make it too complicated. Some people would not drink non kosher milk, but they look at milk has to meet specific requirements. Very orthodox. Any coffee is kosher. Coffee, I mean, you see it even we have here espresso. Maybe I'll just show it here. Um, not not going to advertise for any company. But just to give you an example, they have even a kosher stamp here, if you pay attention. It's here in Hebrew. Kosher, we have it here. Harabanut Basel Schweiz. Probably you can't read it, it's Hebrew. <laughs> but it means it's kosher according to the rabbi in, in, in Basel. So, okay. so just to tell you, they have a lot of kosher products without them knowing it. Also, the chips are kosher on the so called kosher list. So I told them, I told the manager, if somebody asks if you have something kosher, you can say, well, 80% of, of the things are kosher. So hopefully this will help also to, to show that, yes, they can consume something, it's complete, no problem at all, and uh, to make also this communication clear. Um, one, one question regarding sort of the spending behavior. Do the Jewish guests that come here, sort of, do they spend uh, in general a lot or very little? Or sort of what uh, experiences have you made? Because sort of um, it's also like there are stereotypes. No, sort of yeah, Jewish people do not spend a lot. Or sort of would you? Um, how how? And the thing is, sort of there are actually um, figures about the spending behavior, obviously by nationalities. And so, for instance, uh, in Switzerland, sort of people from the GCC countries, they are those that spend the most per day, and then sort of there are there's this ranking. But obviously, sort of because it's done by nationalities, um, yeah, like there's no figures on um, the spending behavior by Jewish guests, for instance, here in Davos. What's your impression, sort of in general? Um, do they, yeah, like uh, what, what? How much do they spend? Sort of are they um, happy spending money or not so much? 
my experience is that they spend not so much. Mm -hmm. They uh, rent an apartment, different apartment, cheaper one, an expensive one, but they need or they give their money especially for food. If you go, they go to the supermarket, they don't stay so much in the restaurant, as we explained before. And, uh, you know, for example, the last few summers we had uh, our cable car was free of charge. That was the reason why the people like to go up to the mountains. And uh, next summer we will see what's happening because they have everybody has to pay for cable part up to the mountain uh, for about 10 friends. So in summer 2020, 2020 it will not be free of charge anymore. It will not be free of charge and uh, it will be one mountain costs uh, 10 francs and uh, more mountains, uh, two or more, costs uh, 15 francs. The same happens with the gas program. Some of them, 50% of the gas program, will be uh, free of charge and 50% we will uh, have a uh, debut of Swiss francs 5 or 10. What, so, what kind of uh, services does the guest program include, like access to... Uh, let's say, for example, uh, wakeboard, uh, battling, uh, lake, uh, uh, combined uh, hiking, uh, lying down from the mountain bike, like gym, or uh, uh, if uh, we have chocolate courses, and so on, and so on. That means there are more than uh, 50 uh, activities during the summer with an 800 experience, uh, we get to the guests, you know. This was free of charge in the past, as well as cable car. So for us, it will be very interesting how much people, especially the Jewish people, will use cable car for the guest performance next summer. And uh, if I hear uh, the colleague from the hotel or restaurant, you know, uh, they are not the the guests who are staying will go outside to make dinner or lunch because at least uh, they are looking for kosher, kosher food and uh, most of them, that's the reason why they are in the apartment, they come to the hotel and uh, eat at home. Okay, so that's the restroom slash um, toilet issue. There was one more is that correct? Yeah, there is the question this is similar to what has just been said. Um, I've heard also from many people that the Jewish guests were mainly the one uh, trying, it's a bit similar to the stereotype that was already mentioned before, trying the ways to get a better price. So trying to renegotiate about many things and getting better prices. We've heard it already now that apparently the Jewish guests were the one using the, the cable car a lot. But here came also with the question, so why do they always want to discuss the prices? And uh, this is something that we've heard a lot. Uh, first of all, this is generally a point we have put in the push. Indeed, this is, I don't think it's something Jewish, it's something cultural in many other cultures. Um, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean culture, you negotiate about prices. It's just part of the life networks. Obviously, that the first price is set, uh, set very too high. And only stupid tourists buy the expensive prices. Usually you go and you negotiate and you take it off down. This is something very common in other countries. I've uh, also lived inside myself. So, of course, when they people, when they come to here, and prices are high in Switzerland, generally, so some will think, well, this is maybe the first price I can always negotiate. That's for one reason to explain. And we've made clear in the brochure that prices in Switzerland, like in shops or many restaurants, are quite indicative. There is no, you can try, but uh, there is no, no way you're going to negotiate about the Coke if you're grocery before for alcohol instead of fun. This is one thing. On the other hand, I need to also to say that I had a little, quite interesting discussion in Ahosa with one person who rents apartments. She complained to me and she said that the Jewish people, they always want to negotiate on the price again and again. Well, and I told her, and what do you do? And she said, well, I give them a robot. So I said, well, of course, I would do the same. I mean, if you're that generous, apparently it works. So <laughs> it's a bit both. It's a bit culturally. But if apparently it works, why shouldn't you do it? So we are quite, um, it's a bit difficult to find the right amount or how much is polite, how much not. But if you see that it works, and indeed they, they offer you 20% um, 
to go down in the prices, apparently it's maybe it's not the way I think I would do it. I wouldn't dare in Switzerland. Maybe it's a strategy that, that doesn't work. Yeah, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, it's absolutely correct. Normally in Switzerland, uh, if you go in the past, uh, you get a, a fixed rate, especially the hotel or in an apartment. Since you can book all over the world on online platforms, then uh, you get everywhere uh, some uh, discount, you know. That's the reason why it's only the, the Jewish people, everybody wants to have uh, a discount of, uh, of your market or your hotel. But especially the, the Jewish people, they ask why we have to pay this rate and not another one. And then it's very difficult also for my employers to explain that this rate, especially in the apartment, they are fixed, being the, the, the taxes, the visit taxes are fixed, the Schlussreinigung is fixed, and also the weekly, weekly uh, uh, rent uh, uh, which they have to pay. You know? and but it always uh, really a uh, big discussion between the guests and ourselves from the tourist office, especially also to the, to the landlords. Uh, Maybe and and uh, here I can I can join in. Hello, I'm still here, even though you cannot see me. Um, I think that's also the the good thing about. Um, sort of this variety of guests we have by now in Switzerland that we realize that sort of some traits that you might attribute to one kind of group sort of is, is, not, is not exclusive of that group. We have heard that Indian people, people from the GCC for them as well, um, prices are to be negotiated often. You know? Sort of they go um, um, offer shopping, they shop for the best offer and so really sort of this, this idea that prices are fixed sort of is, is, is not shared by, by many guests. And, um, and I think in that, in that sense sort of Swiss tourism is also, um, yeah, like in the process of, of simply learning a lot more about cultures from all over the world. Um, and sort of I think this gives us also, this helps us put things into perspective, no? It's not just sort of that, it's not that Jewish people, for instance, try to re uh, negotiate prices, but it's simply sort of people that come especially from the Middle East, maybe from cultures that extend from the uh, sort of the Mediterranean to, to India, sort of in that realm, it's rather um, common to negotiate about prices. So um, in that sense, I think, um, the more diverse uh, our our guests are, sort of, I think, the more difficult it becomes for us also to fall precisely into the this trap of having too rigid and uh, and uh, unfair stereotypes. So, um, is there anything else in terms of concrete issues you wanted to add? I think we discussed uh, the most common cases. There were several small ones. If you want to yeah. be share them with, with you. We have a list of kind of smaller things that happened, typical misunderstandings, but I mean these were the main issues or the main cases that happened not only here also at the other at the other destinations. So yeah, typically the one we actually have that's correct yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um you people out there in front of your computers. So I want to um Join in. Do you do you have any more questions regarding this collaboration between um, the SEG and uh, Davos Organisation? Actually, there was one question regarding Raphael Mosbach. You know? uh, maybe you mentioned that he played also for you uh, an important role. Is that correct? <clears throat> yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, Raphael Mosbach is for many many years he is uh, always here during uh, mostly during this time during the summer and he is our part in the past he was the man when we get some question about jewish people about how to handle it normally we called Raphael and he told us listen you have to do this and that and so on i know him for many years because uh, i was uh, before I was a hotel manager uh, during the World Economic Program, I had always the Shabbat dinner 
uh, that was completely new for me. And I asked him, well, please, could, could you give me some help, some information, how we handle this thing? Uh, Perfect. So we get the information and all over the years we get a good uh, cooperation between the tourist uh, office and the Raphael and now together also with his friends with SIG. And but he was uh, for many years people if you had any question about Jewish people in Davos, then you have to call Raphael. Could you quickly explain sir what his um, what has he been what did he do here in he is, uh, please correct me if I'm not uh, sure, he's a kind of, I think he's a rabbiner. He is the, the people, also for the Jewish people, he's the person where they go there to ask him if there are any questions about the destination, about other things uh, which people want to know. Uh, uh, he's, uh, let's say, he's the tourist office for the Jewish people. Maybe I will just add one little thing. We started this project uh, two years ago, specifically last year. It's also for us very important to understand who are, I mean, we don't want to create something completely new and just step in and be like the experts organizing everything. It was very important from a project management perspective to understand first who are the stakeholders, who are the people who are interested, who are the people who have a lot of knowledge. So I think a big the reason this project was so successful is because we included all these people. So we got in touch with all the rabbis from abroad, from Switzerland. We included, of course, Rafi Mosbach was a big, big help for us also during the pro this uh, summer. So this was also, from my experience, extremely important not to just come in and say, now we have a project and this is how it's going to be done. We included a lot of people. We're for writing the brochures, we're exchanging ideas and thoughts um, to discuss how to handle some best practices cases. So, and often was definitely one of the, of the most important, especially specifically here in Davos, uh, and definitely also one of the reasons why this project has uh, been very successful. Okay, thank you so much for this answer to another question by the students. Is there any other question? From, from your side. Everything clear? At the moment not. Any other comment? It's your opportunity. Um. Do you think the Jewish guests can come this year for three weeks? Uh, that's Selina who's asking. And exactly, what are important influencing factors for the decision making of Jewish guests? Word of mouth. So um, I guess sort of the, the question by Selina has to do with the uh, Corona. Is that correct, Selina? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, what do you expect in terms of Jewish guests coming? I do not know the word for coffee shops, please, in English. It's a, it's a good question. We really do not know what's going on. <clears throat> the experience of the last few days was that uh, we get more and more bookings, especially for the apartment, but especially for Swiss guests. So, uh, we discussed before. Uh, it's a question what's going on, especially in the Benelux uh, countries, in, uh, in Great Britain, uh, in the States, uh, because mostly Jewish people mostly are coming from this country and it depends what's going on for a few uh, weeks. We're still waiting for bookings from Jewish people and there was just a few at the moment and uh, let's say perhaps Especially in Switzerland, we know more about the 27th of May, and now uh, Bundesrat will explain what's going on in the, in the future, and especially also important is what's going on in the other countries. So it's very, very difficult to, to make, uh, give you an answer, uh, it will be in the same uh, amount of the last few years, uh, I really don't know. 
Thank you. And um, in terms of sort of the influencing factor, maybe there are um, sort of an information uh, from sort of from another uh, cultural perspective. Like what we've learned is that especially guests from the GCC, um, but also from India, sort of for whom traveling in families is very common and important. So that they are constantly um, on social media. They really share their experience with the people back home almost all the time. And sort of this is really important also in terms of marketing. Sort of this, I, I guess, uh, Yasmin Hadon referred also a bit to that, to the importance of word of mouth. How do, what, how to market Davos with Jewish guests? Or sort of, is this really, yeah, almost automatic? Once you have this community, sort of demand is being recreated all the time. First of all, I think when you have to take it from a different perspective, when you're a Jewish religious person and you want to travel, you're not going to go on social media and check all the picture and Google and then find the best destination. First thing is already, where could I actually go? If you come with specific, uh, specific requirements, saying that I need to have a place where I can eat kosher, I'd like a place where I can pray in a prayer room, that already narrows down the potential destination. Uh, people, that's also people like to travel. When I'm an Orthodox Jewish person, I will go to a place where there are also other Jewish Orthodox people, because I know this will enable me to keep uh, many laws I couldn't keep if I went to another place. The first question is going to be, what are the potential destinations? And then there are, let's say, in Switzerland, I would say four or five. And then you now write down, and that probably works uh, with mouth of word. And, and the community is very connected. Not on social media, but uh, socially connected, so social without media. They are very social, they discuss a lot, they exchange a lot. So it's probably going to work with uh, uh, word of mouth, exchanging ideas. And then it's going to come all these factors. Yes, the host was very nice, people were very friendly, the weather was good. Uh, that, that's, yeah. I think it's rather this. Where can I go? And then you narrow it down to the, which one of these four or five collections. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, but you know, Davos, especially the question of tradition. Those for many, many years, Jewish people are staying in Davos, starting uh, during the, the, the health time, uh, starting in 1920. Uh, I remember uh, or do remember that there are some Jewish sanatorium in Davos. And since uh, over the two years, we have also kosher hotels, it's very important, because there they have the place, they can have the, the, the synagogue, the prayer room, uh, they can have kosher food, and they know how to have Jewish people. For the reason why the people will come to those or special places like Rosa or South or the woods. But as a, as a destination management organization, you don't really have a special marketing campaign for no, Jewish people. Absolutely not, because you know, uh, Jewish people are uh, traveling mostly together with their family. It's quite a difference between if you get into a cook uh, business like with uh, Chinese people, with uh, other countries where you get uh, special marketing towards. Uh, like in you know, with India, like uh, Russell, uh, Geneva, Montreal, is the, the people from Asia. Uh, especially, I don't know, it's a question why the people are here, it's a question of tradition. They travel with the family and uh, they discuss together how you can stay in the world, how it's the only way. Okay, thank you so much. Um, One last question, a general question to the Likrat meeting in Davos. Did the Likrat change the behavior and understanding of the residents, but also of the Jewish guests? Were there any problems with local inhabitants who, did, who didn't want to change their behavior? So let's take this as a last question. In, in general, sort of, I think it has already been said that sort of these uh, Likrat sessions, sort of, they, they happen quite successful, they have had an impact on both sides, and that's the reason why you continue with it. Um, maybe sort of resistance, opposition, could you say something yeah. about that? We've spoken already now about the big cases, but 
most of the of my job of, of or of our job we were here were actually smaller things talking to people on the street and there were a lot of questions so we had questions from the local people who told me oh i always wanted to ask something about the jews i don't dare you know i'm afraid of asking them same from the jewish people saying i wanted to know why you swiss da, 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 da. i'm not a, a bit scared of asking so from my experience and from the experience of all the mediators I really need to say that about 90% of the cases of the experience, of the small experience every day, were extremely, extremely positive. People that were interested, people wanted to learn more. So I'm summarizing it as a absolutely beautiful. On the other end, yes, like with every project, there is no way. There are people who think it's, it's a waste. We have local people who say, as I said at the beginning, who say, look, this is my country. Whoever comes to here needs to adapt. I don't need to learn nothing about these guests. This is Swiss law. We have travelers, Jewish travelers, who say, I'm the guest, I'm spending here money, so they can be happy to have me here. I don't need to adapt nothing about the country. Now, you have these people always from each culture, from every, every place, and those people are not too positive to this project. They think it's a waste of sources and a waste of, waste of time. But again, this is a very, very small amount. And I also don't think that you reach this when you have an attitude that's strict already, very negative, there's not going to be a big impact. But of course, you make the impact on the vast, vast majority that is either interested, or as I said at the beginning, that is rather neutral and just happy out of, um, out of personal interest, out of business interest, but just have an interest in learning more, understanding what people come here, or people who travel to a country who want to learn more about the country they're in. So our experience was very positive, a lot of small, positive uh, discussion, Q&A with people uh, here in the office. So I think that's a very nice um, closing statement for, for the moment. Thank you very much. It's almost one o'clock. Let's have a break, lunch break. Uh, and at two o'clock, we'll continue with our panel discussion, where we will broaden the horizon a little bit, sort of the the scope of cultures uh, in order to contextualize a bit what we heard about Jewish guests um, in, in the bigger picture, no? and, and see sort of how Davos fares and deals with um, cultures also from, from other countries. Thanks for um, being with us and see you in, in an hour. Bye-bye.